Hello and welcome to Locator Gaming. This video is one video in a series of three videos about Compass Games' Battle of Gettysburg game and the Battle Hymn system. Two of the videos are me talking about my playthrough of the game, and the third video is kind of a time-lapse video of the pieces moving across the board. So if you haven't seen those other two videos, go ahead and check those videos out. And if you like what you see here, please hit the subscribe, the like button, and that bell icon for the notifications. Hello, and welcome to Locator Gaming. I'm going to do something a little bit different for my channel today. I've been uh, really wanting to play a war game. I recently played Memoir 44 and put that up on the channel, but um, I really like these Hex Encounter war games as well. Normally on the channel I do, you know, like campaign games, and I've done some card games, um, but not a Hex Encounter game. And this is going to be a little bit different too because the other stuff I put up on the channel is usually a like the complete game, like every little agonizing decision that I'm going to make. I'm not going to do that with a Hex Encounter game because I'd be sitting here for ever and I don't think anyone would ever watch uh, something that long. What I'm going to do though is I will come in and record little bits and things that I think are interesting um, to show. And I'm also at, I'm going to put up a I'm going to try to do this thing where I take time lapse, uh, take photos of the game and then put this time lapse video together. So that might go in conjunction with this up at the same time. So you can kind of see the pieces moving as I play. I don't know. I'm going to try it and see how it comes out. So what am I going to play? Um, two of my favorite uh, battles to study and to play are Gettysburg from the Civil War and the Battle of Bulge from World War II. And fortunately, those two battles have a lot of games made about them, especially Gettysburg. So I will start with this one. Um, I'll start with Gettysburg. So this is uh, in the Battle Hymn series. It's two, two battles in the box, actually, Gettysburg and Pea Ridge, but I'm just going to do the Gettysburg one. It's by Compass Games, uh, game designer Eric Lee Smith. Kind of a new system. I think Volume 2 is um, in the works. It's not out yet, um, but Volume 2 is in the works of that. Um, so Gettysburg, um, this is the, I'm going to play like the whole campaign. I'm not going to go too much into the rules of the game. I just want to tell like the story of what's happening. Because one of the reasons why I like to play those like campaign games and like Arkham Horror the Card game is because of the story that those games tell while you're playing it. So I'm going to try to do is um, just come back and tell you know the story of what's going on with the battle i don't want to get too much into history or anything either so um basically what was happening with gettysburg is lee's army had invaded the north and um the union army was was tracking them and they actually got uh to a little bit they got farther north than than the union army did and the way this map is oriented is this direction is north. So then you got west and east. And um, the Confederate army the, is going to be coming from this side of the board. And the Unions are going to be coming up from this direction. And they had gone into Gettysburg, I think, to look mainly for shoes or supplies or something the Confederate army had um, and on the day before. So this starts on July 1st, and I think it was the day before. And uh, they thought there was just a little bit of militia in Gettysburg. Um, but little did they know that it was like, I think, an advanced party of uh, cavalry that had scattered them out. So that was on the day before. And then on the next day, on July 1st in the morning, uh, you have some cavalry that are posted out here blocking the road. And uh, some of the Confederates who are marching down here to... Um, see what actually is in front of them. A little bit of a blind attack by the South here at Gettysburg. And a lot of people say this is a turning point of the war. Um, I don't think the South ever went on the offensive again after this. And if uh, the North had lost this, uh, they could have gone on to maybe Washington, which is down that way-ish from here since this is north. Um, a couple things I will say about the game itself. This is a chit pull system. So there will be these chits that will say who gets to go when and what you get to do. 
and they all go into a cup or a bowl or a container and you pull them out one at a time and the one that you pull out is who gets to go. So it's not necessarily just a you can do whatever you want whenever you want. Um, down here on the board, these are the turns. Uh, at the end of each day, you'll check to see if someone has won. So you'll check here at the end of day one, here at the end of day two, and here at the end of day three. The turns do get progressively lengthier in the amount of time that they actually were in the actual uh, battle. And I think they did that because of like soldiers get tired and stuff. So they might've been able to do a whole lot on the first day in shorter amounts of time, but then they're tired. So it takes a little bit longer to do the same amount of stuff and so on and so on. That's why the third day is so much shorter than the second and first. And also to uh, mimic you not being able to move as much stuff on the second and third day before an actual um, turn starts, each side has to take some of their chits out of the cup. Right now there's not a lot in the cup because there's not a lot of um, units out on the board, but as more and more of these, um, what I've got laid out on the time track here are the reinforcements when they're supposed to come out. As more and more of these guys arrive out onto the battlefield, uh, more and more chits will go in here to be pulled out every turn. What you see out on the map right now, these gray spots are um, objectives, victory point spots for the south, and these blue, these big blue ones with the American flag on them are victory point spots for the north. And we've only got three um, actual units on the board to start. And these are the um, Union Cavalry. Oh, and you know what? And I was actually going to start them dismounted. So I will do that in between uh, the first cut and the next comeback here. Because um, Cavalry can either be on their horses or they can be off. And when they're off their horses, they fight a little bit more like infantry, which is going to give them a chance to retreat. So let's just talk basic strategy, what I'm going to have the guy, the, each of the two um, sides do. There's going to be a lot more Confederates coming on on this first day early than, uh, than Union. And what historically happened, which is probably what's going to happen in the game too, I'll try to do something different than history just because it makes it more interesting, is uh, the Union guys will come up this way and try to hold them off as long as possible but then slowly retreat back and through the town and then they take up they took up positions along uh culp's hill and cemetery ridge all the way down to people have probably heard of before little round top down here and then this is big round top and on the second day it was more like a pattern like this and they call that the fish hook and then a lot of people also have probably heard of Pickett's Charge. That was on the third day. That was main, mostly like from here across this big open space um, towards Union positions that were here. So the battle ended up with the Union here and the South attacking them from all sides. So we'll see where it goes during the game. Uh, if there's anything interesting as far as the rules or scenarios that come up, I'll just I'll come back and, and talk about it. All right, see you in a minute. All right, that's the end of turn one. Not a whole lot happened. Nobody was close enough to actually do any fighting. We had um, Heath's division come onto the board and move up. They're starting to do their little um, poke towards Gettysburg. And part of the first corps uh, is on its way up here to try to re help relieve the cavalry in defending the town. Pretty basic and simple first turn. Cavalry did not get to move. They don't get to start moving until the second turn. Um, so they're just holding their defensive spot. All right, we'll be back uh, when something else happens in turn two. Just wanted to come back real quick. The turn's not over, but um, we've got our first uh, guys getting up close and personal here. So we've got more of the first core moving up the road. And then Heath... His division got to activate, so we got a couple guys that moved up next to the dismounted cavalry. Um, in this game, you get these little uh, these little moving and firing markers on them. 
when when you move up next to a uh, oh that's not in focus when you move up next to an enemy unit because you only do combat when a uh, specific chit comes out of the cup the combat chit comes out of the cup and if you move up next to an enemy um, and combat starts they get to take some some shots at you kind of like defensive fire shots uh, and these markers will stay out there and help you remember that hey those guys moved up next to somebody and now let me see if this will be in focus there you can see this little moving and firing chit and those will stay there uh, they don't go away at the end of the turn they go away at the night turns I think but I, they don't go away until either the, uh, these guys will disengage or the actual combat happens and then some more um, parts of that division moved up the road these cavalry guys are not too pleased with their current position I did not get their chit to move them out of the way though and these this is where they start uh, because now they're downhill this guy's at least in a forest uh, but these guys are out in the open and they're downhill so these guys got the high ground on them um, oh no actually no they've got the high ground this is the valley sorry where the river is oh they're actually pretty happy where they are then so I don't think these could actually have started here they probably have to go back another one because they're not supposed to be in line of sight for the, from their from their units. So two, three, four, five, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So those horses got to move back a little bit. They got to be down on the other side of the ridge. So this light, this lighter colored is is the ridges. Is the high ground compared to this darker stuff down down in the valleys had that backwards in my head when I was just looking at this position so I'll continue on with this turn and come back when uh, there's something else to show you all right so I just pulled the um, Union combat turn chit out of the uh, out of the cup so it looks like that and what I decided to do is just retreat, is pull back. Um, especially here, this unit, uh, Davis, is an 8, which is pretty strong against this cavalry here, which only is a 3, 3, three strength points. So uh, they retreated back into the forest on the hill. Um, we're just here to kind of delay until some more of our stronger units can come up. Um, now this kind of leaves the artillery out here. They were not allowed to retreat because they were not right next to an enemy. Only the two dismounted cavalry units were. Um, so that leaves Gamble here kind of down in the valley, but their ability to move is still inside the cup. And these guys have already had their move turn. So we'll be able to pull back and get where we want to be um, before they get to do any kind of combat or anything. All right, so we've had a couple of turns already, or a couple of activations already into the third turn. I finished the second turn and reset. Uh, there's some reinforcements that are gonna come out in the third turn, um, but Heat's division got to activate its movement, and they got some pretty strong units, so I think I have gotten the Union Cavalry in trouble here, because um, this must be Devin here, probably, yeah, Devin is a little surrounded um, so even if he tries to retreat back to his horses he's gonna move through an enemy zone of control and he'll take a step uh, loss he'll take a strength point loss for that then over here what I think I screwed up on this side is not putting gamble in a better spot because he has to retreat too so he's gonna retreat right past his horses um, uh, if he retreats we haven't gotten the combat turn for the Union yet we did pull the very first one I pulled out was the combat turn for the Confederates when they were still too far back so that doesn't help them and we might get to retreat again when we pull out the combat turn for the Union we'll have to see uh, what 
develops before then. Because there are some really strong units in here like this one. No, not Brock and Bro. That one's actually kind of weak. Pedigree right here is an eight. Again, so we've got three here for Devin and four here for Gamble. He does have to split his fire between the two if we do that combat. Um, but Devin has to split his fire. He's only got three points left. He's got a three strength point um, marker there. And he's got three guys that he's in their zone of control. So he'd only get to do one point, one strength point against each one. So I don't know. I might have gotten the cavalry in trouble, uh, but first core is pretty close. They might be able to maybe even cut across the seminary ridge to start putting some pressure on the flank over here. We'll see what happens. So the Union combat turn chit did come out, and uh, before they retreated, um, Caleb's battery did get a shot off, and we got uh, the first hit of the game. So we got some demoralized guys here in Archer's Brigade. And uh, is this Devin or Gamble? Yeah, Devin had to retreat through an enemy uh, zone of control, so he took a hit. And I don't actually think that I could retreat back onto my horses because you can't stack in this game. And I can't retreat back, I don't think, and, you know, uh, remount because it takes three movement points to mount on your horses. So I think I have to uh, stay on the side of the horses there. And when they get their next movement, we can get back on the horses. So we still got a couple of units that haven't gone yet this turn. Uh, the 11th Corps started coming down the road over here too. And I think Pegram moved up, some artillery moved up, up onto part of this hill over here since the last time. So I'm into turn four and the cavalry's, the Union Cavalry chit came out for them to move. So fortunately they were able to uh, get back to their horse holders, get on their horses, and I thought about just kind of running to the other side uh, of, of Gettysburg to hold over here um, for a while, because I do know that once we get to turn, is it Rhodes or early? There, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of guys that come in from this way pretty soon in a couple of turns. Uh, but then I was like, oh, that's just going to leave this wide open for them to just run through if their chit comes out before the first core gets to move up. So I kind of left them there. I mean, they're now they're back to being cavalry, so they'll get to retreat anyway. Um, but their zone of controls, they'll be able to stop guys from just running, uh, like running right through. Uh, I did take, I forgot to mention that I did take the victory point markers off because I didn't want to have them stuffing up the board with a bunch of counters. Um, but I basically know, and I'll check it if I need to, that it's the round tops here. The Confederates are trying to take this high ground basically around here. And the Union wants um, some of the outskirts um, spots. And you don't check it until the end of the day anyway. In addition to that, uh, the other, part of the other victory conditions are that the Confederate player has to have uh, 1.5 times the number of points, and points are determined by how many units you've knocked out. Um, I don't need to look it up right now, but points come into play um, if the Union has inflicted more losses onto the Confederate side. I believe they end up they win at the end of day one, but we'll see when we get there. All right, I've come to the end of turn four, which is the 10.45 a.m. turn. And the Union First Corps did get their move chit out first. So they were actually able, um, the Iron Brigade is here. They were able to come up and get into position uh, on the ridge here. And then Heath got, his chit was the last one that came out. So Pettigrew and Archer stood still. Um, they're going to get to fight here if the combat turn chit comes out early next time and then we also swung around here so the iron brigade is kind of in a bad spot at the moment because uh, they've got people on all sides but they are a plus three morale unit 
Oh no, I switched it up. That's Cutler. This is the Iron Brigade down here. Yeah, that's right. I wanted the uh, the better uh, morale on the split down here without thinking about the fact that these guys were going to come around. So Cutler with uh, zero addition, additional uh, modifier for his morale is kind of in a little bit of trouble right there. So he might retreat if he gets the chance. And we've got a lot of, of approaching fire, a lot of movement and uh, fire possible. So we could have uh, a really uh, bloody shootout here, depending upon what comes out. Um, or what order stuff comes out from the cup next turn. So I'm a little bit further into turn five and uh, we got lucky I think for the Union player that the first course chit came out before combat came out. So I was able to get Cutler out. So we, we just reestablished a line and one other thing that I had noticed when the first course chit came out in turn four I had forgot to move um, Stone's Brigade, he was he was back here. He entered on the third turn, fourth turn he should have been up here, and then he, so he kind of got a double move. Um, and then Wainwright came up, so that's the first core artillery there. And um, Biddle has finished his move from the side of the board over here, so we've kind of got a line going here. Um, I know that we need to protect the victory hexes over here. And something else that I had done, um, I was moving Pender's division. It's these guys um, here, and his artillery here. It, it moved up. The, whoopsie! It moved up the road. I think that's where Garnet was. Close enough. Um, but we kind of got a little bit of a traffic jam here, so I decided to take these guys kind of on this minor road here. We split half of them this way, and we'll try coming up a little over here and these two will kind of went up the road they were farther back so they took the main road up a little further and they're going to go over land to get here i thought about bringing the first corps in to attack this side of the flank here but this is artillery right here and it's on the high ground and that stuff can just chew you up um if you let it get canister fire on you. So I didn't think that was the best plan. We might have to let it eventually, like if we can get a bunch of guys in there and then it has to split its fire is one thing. Um, but just, I had thought about moving um, one of these guys, either Baxter or Paul down into there or maybe an Iron Brigade, but I don't want to let the Iron Brigade just get chewed up by canister fire. So, right, that's where we are so far in turn five. So I've started turn six, and I just wanted to come and talk about, so Heath's uh, division has moved up, and I kind of swapped um, Pettigrew and Archer. So Pettigrew came around this way um, after Archer moved up here, because Pettigrew is a much better unit. He's got a strength points of eight and a morale of plus one. And Archer, he actually took some more bombardment fire from uh, Wainwright's artillery back here uh, at the end of turn five when the Union combat um, chit came out. The only thing I really could do was shoot the artillery. And um, now there's the potential for, again, another potential for a lot of uh, combat depending upon what comes out of the cup here because they've moved all up against the first uh, the first core there so we've got um, Heath's division pretty much lined up against the first core except for uh, the first core's left flank over here is not up against anybody but if um, is this Pegram or Perrin no Perrin is part of I think this is Pegram I think that's his name. If he gets to move, he can get up here pretty close to uh, causing some problems on the flank over here. So if the first core gets to move, Biddle might want to take a step back, even though he'd be going down into the valley, or maybe he would, he'll move back here onto Seminary Ridge. We'll have to see. It's not great having both of these hexes blocked because that means there's no like retreat lane. 
Um, if he re retreats back into somebody, especially Caliph's battery here, Caliph's battery, it could be devastating because they've only got one strength point. And if he gets demoralized, then he's just coming off the board. Still on turn six, there's been a lot of uh, position jockeying. Um, the 11th core got to move, so they moved up and have started going through Gettysburg. The two units that were in the front up here, they're not the best units. They're minus one morale units. Um, that's a strength five. It's also a strength five, but that minus one is not great. They've kind of come in and surrounded, I think that's Davis. Yeah, they've kind of surrounded Davis. So Davis is in a little bit of trouble because he is now technically surrounded. So there will be modifiers when those attacks happen. Um, and then and First Corps also got to move. None of these guys on the line moved because um, we're going to get to do some good firing against um, all of these Confederate units that moved in. Um, but I also repositioned on this side. I thought about just going straight into the side, but then that really leaves open this road for uh, these guys here to just uh, maybe come around and get behind and then do the same thing on this side that we're kind of doing to them on that side. Um, so we took a position on McPherson's Ridge here, trying to block um, any movement to get around. Um, so these guys will probably just come slam right into them and try to fold the Union left. We'll see. We still got um, Rhodes' big division to come in. And um, if one of the combat chick comes out, there's going to be a lot of fighting. The Confederates really need to push towards their victory point hexes. So I don't think they'll... Uh, retreat except for maybe Davis he might voluntarily retreat and he could go through here because there's a friendly unit and then back to here might be a smart thing to do but we'll see what comes out all right so I just pulled the combat the confederate combat shit out of the cup so we're about to have quite a few rolls it looks like so what happened in between was Pender moved up Oh, actually, I also got the artillery reserve. So Pegram pulled back um, away from from Baxter's brigade here, and then Pender moved up and is he's got four brigades against these two of the first corps on this side, and also um, Rhodes, his division Chit came out, so they came in from uh, these three starting hexes and are moving down these roads. And um, the lead unit, it's a, it's a strength of four, but a plus two morale um, was able to get into contact with this unit here from the 11th Corps. So I'm going to go through and do this combat round, and then I will come back and show you the results. All right, so that took a while. There was a lot of combat there, and um, I kind of started up here and just went down the line. So, uh, Rhodes' unit that came up, he completely just annihilated that 11th Corps unit that was there. Got an amazing roll. Um, that unit was in a town space, so it was easier to hit him. Town spaces start with a six or, or fewer, and it's a plus two morale unit, so, and he got to roll four dice, so that was good, but then the 11th Corps unit got an easy, or got a, not easy, got a lucky shot back and actually um, forced him to retreat. He took a, took a loss. He went to plus two morale. I think I rolled a one or something. It was a terrible morale check for them. And they actually had to, had to retreat. Um, then the Confederate attack in the middle here kind of got beat up pretty bad. Archer was already pretty hurt, so he crumbled quickly. Rock and Bro is only uh, three strength and a minus one morale, so he got ch chewed up. But then even Pettigrew, who was like one of the best units on the board, and added eight strength and a plus one morale, the Iron Brigade just devastated him. 
Um, and the unfortunate thing for Pettigrew, he almost probably would have wanted to fail his morale check because he did not retreat back. And the way I look at the rules, it's... Uh, You know, you go back to fire combat. You know, you do two rounds of combat. And they were locked in, and the Iron Brigade did not take any damage. Um, Paul here, though, has only got one strength point left. He passed all of his morale checks, but he's um, mostly demoralized. So that unit there was pretty tore up. Then over here on the Union's left and the Confederate right, down here on McPherson's Ridge, um, Perrin's or Pinder, Pinder's division just tore through the two little guys from the first corps that I had um, posted out there. Um, but they did some pretty good damage back. Um, Perrin's brigade only has two strength on, you know, two strength points that are intact still remaining. Uh, Lane took one demoralization and Thomas took one demoralization. And Scales actually was uh, took a loss, took two, uh, took two losses. I think he took one in the approach fire. Yeah, he took one in the approach fire, and he took another one in the actual um, uh, close-up combat and had to retreat. He was here. He had to retreat back. So kind of a little victory on this side for the Confederates, but they got tore up in the middle in, a, in another... Uh, kind of little victory over there so we've got some units in the shattered boxes for confederate and some units in the shattered box for the union and we've still got um one more move turn and the union's combat turn in the cup for turn six so i don't think there's gonna be a whole lot more that happens on Turn six, maybe a little bombardment from the Union artillery, but that's probably about it. All right, I'm back. Uh, it's a different day. Obviously, you can probably tell from a different shirt from the last little clip. Um, and I've started turn seven, but I wanted to cut in here real quick because I'm two chits into the turn. So I've pulled um, Pender and then the uh, Union combat turn. And Pender moved forward. Um, and now on the U.S. or the Union combat turn, so I get to do artillery bombardments before um, I elect to do attacker uh, retreats before combat. So what I'm thinking about doing is, um, so this unit over here, Perrin's unit, is pretty weak. He's only got one or two more um, intact strength points. But he's a plus two morale, so it's going to be hard for Bombardment to do anything to him. And he actually came right up next to Horse Artillery. Now, Horse Artillery, if they were defending, they would have to retreat out of this situation, is at least my understanding of the rules, because they're next to an enemy unit. But I don't think that happens when I'm the attacker, um, because it very specifically says on the other player's combat turn, and you, and you have to do a defender retreat before combat. So I think this Horse Artillery... Uh, if it wants to participate, can get some really good damage with canister fire into this guy. This is an extremely weak Union unit right here. It's got only one intact strength point left. The rest is all demoralized. So he might retreat out. But I think I'm going to use this artillery here to bombard um, this unit here. He has five intact strength point units, but he's or strength points, but he's a, a zero morale. Also got scales over here that's got uh, two intact strength points. So the Iron Brigade would have to split its fire between those two if he, uh, if I choose to stay there and fight with him. I've also got Osborne's artillery back here, who should be able to see this unit right here because it's up on top of a hill. Now this one bombarding would be downhill, and these units do not block line of sight. And even though this is a forest, I'm going along the hex side here, so that shouldn't block line of sight either if I want to bombard there. So I'm pretty sure this artillery here could bombard either there or there. Um, but this unit here, Thomas, is already pretty... Well, he's got three intact strength points. I'm trying to decide, like, what's the better way to go um, on tr who do I try to 
uh, bombard against. I don't think the horse artillery can bombard because they're next to an enemy unit. So they need to concentrate here. I think only these two guys back here. Um, this one cannot see this unit because this hill and this forest would be in the way. Uh, but there's no problem with that one bombarding here. So I think we'll go here to try to reduce the, the, the bigger unit um, strength points because this uh, guy here gets to roll five dice and it's a clear clear terrain so we start out with a five um, it's range two so that takes it down to I need two or less to hit but downhill makes it three or less to hit and he has a plus one morale rating so four or less to hit so I get to roll five dice uh, with a 40% chance of rolling hits and um, Let's just do it. Let's do one on camera. So five dice. Going after this guy here, looking for fours or less. So we got three. Three hits. So now what I would do is, if you had more than one of these things that was going on, uh, you mark them with that so you don't forget because you're supposed to do all the fires first before uh, you go to the next part which is uh, the morale check. So now this unit gets to do a morale check. On a one through five, he's gonna fail. On a six through 10, he's gonna pass. Uh, that's a five. And then we have to add his morale rating, which again was a zero. So that's one through five, he fails. So that just demoralized three of his strength points. Um, so he went from, a, went from having five strength points to now only having two. So, we'll mark that with four demoralizations. Did I throw the unit somewhere? That right here. And now the consideration is the next step after bombardment, even though I've, I'm still gonna do the bombardment back here, but I'll do that one off camera. Um, so the next consideration is um, attacker retreats. So I'll do that bombardment off camera and then I'll figure out what to do. I do like maybe getting all this approach fire in here. Paul's really weak though. Uh, maybe I'll just retreat Paul and fight with the Iron Brigade right here. Uh, we'll see. All right, so the Iron Brigade stood their ground and they're pretty happy that they did. I mean, they're a plus three morale unit, which, and they were on a hill in a woods air, uh, hex. They didn't take any uh, hits at all. And they disintegrated um, both of the units that were up against them. I mean, they weren't full units to begin with. And the bombardment from Wainwright actually helped on the unit that was facing the Iron Brigade. And Paul did just decide to retreat, and so did um, Caleb's battery, the horse artillery. Uh, they retreated before the attack. So while it looks a little iffy with the uh, units that are here, that could make a run for some of the victory point spots that are on Cemetery Ridge right here. Um, they're not very strong right here. So... It looks like it's going to be up to the Confederate movement. Uh, we do have, is that Early's division, I think it is, that's about to come on. I can't remember for sure. Um, and they're going to come on from over there. We do have the cavalry up there just kind of blocking the road. They're probably going to get disintegrated, but they're doing a little blocking action, which they need to do to uh, stop those guys from coming in. All right, we'll check back uh, when some more action happens. All right, so in between the last cut and now, uh, Gamble moved back a little bit, and then Early's Division got to come on. I thought about kind of surrounding or trying to get on more than one side. I wouldn't be able to surround him, but I could get on more than one hex attack against the cavalry, but I didn't want a chance that on, if they didn't get their retreat roll, that on approach fire, that they might be able to do a demoralization or whatever. So I just left the lead units to fight them and I left them on the road so that after those cavalry are moved out of the way we can keep moving on down the road. Then Rhodes Division 
moved in um, and is kind of sweeping around this direction. And it has left the 11th core out here in some trouble. They are uh, kind of seriously cut off out there. And I drew the next chit out and it was the Confederate combat turn. So I'm gonna do this combat turn and I'll come back and show you the results. All right, I just finished the combat turn and the 11th core was uh, hurt pretty significantly. All of those units that were up there um, reached their demoralization capacity, so they're shattered. They all had minus one morale. They're not the best units to begin with. Um, and they were kind of surrounded. So I kind of left them out to dry and I hope that doesn't come back to haunt the Union. And I kind of thought of it a little strategy while I was looking at that because, so fighting out of a town is, is at a disadvantage and shooting into a town is better than shooting into even a clear hex terrain because shooting into a town you start with a base of six or, or lower on your two hit number versus clear terrain is five so i was kind of thinking that i probably should have taken up positions like in these clear hexes around the town and then made the confederates fight at me outside of the town and maybe i'll do that with the first core now um, there's a couple more 11 core 11th core units here that's they haven't had their movement turn yet and also Devin was pretty, Devin was annihilated up here. Um, he was just, he was shattered, but he actually got a lot of really lucky rolls and has gotten this haze unit down to only one intact strength point. He only started with four to begin with, but he has done two demoralizations and he inflicted a strength point, um, I think during the approach fire step. So, we're down to not a whole lot of Union units on the board. We're gonna get some more reinforcements for the Union in the next two turns, but there's also a lot of Confederate units coming onto the board in the next three turns. Although they'll be starting a ways away now from the action, so it'll take them a while to get up. Okay, so I'm about to start turn eight, and I just wanted to come back real quick to talk about, uh, in this scenario, it talks about the Confederates now have the initiative in turns 8, 9, 10, and 11 on the first day. What that means is that their, their combat turn chit does not go into the cup. Uh, if you're playing opposed, whoever was playing as the Confederate player gets to hold on to this combat turn chit and play it whenever they want during the turn. So I'll hold this back and I'll play it when I feel like it's an advantageous time for the Confederate player to... Um, to play it. So there's a couple Union reinforcements that are due this turn and it's the start of this Anderson's division I think coming on and that and it's the start of I think that Slocum's core. What core is that? The 12th core for the Union and this is a slaggard of the first core. Um, we're on the 345 p.m. turn in the afternoon still on July 1st so I'll come back when something happens so I did uh, just real quick at the end of the last turn I pulled this 11th Corps guys up here onto Cemetery Hill um, if Rhodes's division gets to move they can get awfully close to Culp's Hill up here and these are two victory point spots up there uh, so I'll need Slocum's guys to get up here and help defend these victory point spots as soon as possible. All right, I f did the entire turn eight. Uh, there was not a whole lot of action. Uh, the only thing that happened during the combat turns was some artillery bombardment, and I think the only thing that actually came out of that was uh, Osborne actually got a demoralization on Ramsour here, and Smith in the front here took a demoralization. Uh, I was really was looking at moving up to maybe do an attack um, over here, maybe maybe push in, but I really want these guys here from Rhodes Division to move this way and take these two victory point spots on Culp's Hill if they get come if if their shit comes out of the cup first. 
and and then they can push this direction and then early moved uh, from the road kind of in the middle of town he'll move into the middle and then what's left of Heath and Pender um, will think about pushing over here um, but they are pretty beat up so I don't know if I actually even really want to go in or maybe just wait it out until the night turns to get some strength back you know like maybe try to play a little smart we'll see, I guess we'll see what happens how the chits come out of the out of the cup um, because like if Slocum can take those spots those are pretty good defensive spots in the woods uphill um, yeah and then Gamble just was running <laughs> he kind of went along the creek here is it the creek and he kind of went along the creek and then down the road trying to run back over to the Union side so we'll see um, see if the conf if the Confederates want to try to push the Union off for a, a first day victory but they also have to have 1.5 times the number of victory points also and that's determined by the number of losses and demoralizations and uh, this here does not look like it's going to be 1.5 times uh, what I've got over here and they've got some severe losses out on the board too that are going to count as victory points for the Union. The Union actually will win on the first day if they end up with more victory points than the Confederate. So the Confederate player doesn't really want to give up a whole lot more victory points. And the Union player doesn't want to just sacrifice a bunch of units either running out there trying to chase victory points either so I don't know we'll see it might be a pretty slow rest of the first day just setting up for a bunch of combat on the second day well there's only been one chip pulled from the cup and it was the 12th core so I just wanted to come show this real quick because the Union got lucky uh, those two units of Slocum were able to come and sneak up onto Culp's Hill so right now they're holding the defensive positions for those victory point spots that Rhodes was trying to go get. So now he might have to pay a hefty price to get up there, uh, but still maybe worth it. And then the reinforcements got to move on to the board. All right, so since uh, the last time I was here, uh, Davis moved up from Heath's division. I made a mistake by not moving Garnett a little closer, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave it because I should have caught that. Um, Gamble was able to swing around, has taken a position in the forest, and Pender moved way down over here just to kind of put up a little protection on the right flank. There is a first core unit that's coming down this way. They're just too weak. I don't want them to get chewed up. Perrin is a plus two morale unit, so he can recover quite a bit in the nighttime potentially. So we'll see um, uh, how he does uh, rallying during the night. So I don't really want to get him too chewed up. Um, so right now he's just kind of over here guarding the flank. And I decided to move them down because I counted out and I had enough room for early to move out of the town. and. I made the decision to just, hey, let's try it. Even though the Iron Brigade is up there on the hill with no SP losses so far, which is practic or which is uh, frankly quite amazing, um, but they are a plus three morale unit. So um, I think what I'm gonna do is have the Confederate player play their combat turn chit now. I was debating on whether I should wait and maybe have Rhodes attack also, but I think I'm gonna have a little bit of uh, discretion on the Confederate left flank and maybe even pull O'Neill back and we'll just try try this push over here and see what happens on this turn. Um, that's just a lot of fire that's going to be coming down off of the hill fighting up into woods uphill just doesn't seem like a good idea. So we'll probably just pull uh, O'Neill back in the in the option where we have the attacker can retreat during their combat turn. So I'm going to do the combat turn for the Confederates and then 
um, come back and show the results of that. Well, that may have cost the Confederates the game. We'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, Early's division is pretty much gone. I mean, Hayes is back here sitting with one intact strength point. I mean, they didn't take too many losses. Um, I think Gordon might have taken two actual losses. Um, but the Iron Brigade just ate him up. And Cutler was sitting there with six intact strength points. Um, now, they were hit also, so the Iron Brigade suffered two demoralizations. Cutler's uh, taken four demoralizations, so he's only got two intact uh, strength points left. I was kind of banking on the artillery bombardment maybe getting one demoralization somewhere or two. It did absolutely nothing. I rolled very poorly. They didn't have very great odds anyways. I think I had to roll ones for everybody except for maybe Pegram. But, and Pegram was a plus two and he didn't even, he rolled terrible. Five dice at, at maybe threes. Didn't get a single. No, I think he got one hit, but they made their morale. Um, and on a bombardment, if they make their morale, nothing happens. So the only thing that did happen, uh, there was a unit that was shattered, uh, the unit that was um, up here. I elected not to take the ground because if I did, then Davis would have to fight all three of these um, units here or spread his um, points across those three units, one of them being the Iron Brigade. You know, I guess that wouldn't be an, an uphill attack. Maybe it would be a, a chance to maybe do some damage, but... Um, and Davis has seven SPs. I don't think I'm going to do it. I don't want to take any more losses on the Confederate side because it's probably going to be pretty close on who has more victory points. Because if the Union has more at the end of the day, then they technically have a day one victory. I may play the game out, even if they do, just to see how it goes. Because um, I'd be kind of curious. But I think uh, maybe the Confederates got a little too loose, too fast. We'll have to wait and see. All right, so that's the end of day nine. Uh, the only other interesting, sort of interesting thing that happened when the Union combat turn came out, uh, Osborne got some lucky hits on Ramsour there and did two more demoralization. I mean, Ramsour is a plus two morale unit, and I rolled a one for his morale check on the bombardment. So that doesn't help the Confederates side. Um, and now I'm kind of contemplating. So he does have Anderson coming up, and then Yule is going to also come up from here. I think they're just too far away to get anything done in the next two turns. So I'm going to have to think about where I want to set them up for probably day two. And I'm sitting here as the Union player thinking, you know, kind of a little gamey though, like, hey, if I just need to have more victory points than the Confederate player at the end of the day, what if I rush off here and maybe attack? Now that Ram Sewer's only got one intact strength point left, I mean, O'Neill's pretty strong here with six, but we'd be sitting in Forest, Texas if we, if we hopped down off this mountain, or it's not a mountain, the hill, They've even got more of the 12th Corps coming up behind. I know the Union's looking like they're in a pretty good spot at the moment. So I'm kind of I'm contemplating if I if I want to charge down the hill and maybe do some damage to the left flank of the Confederates over there. And maybe they should have actually pressed. Uh, the attack on that side last turn might be their only hope is to try to do some damage um, but the 12th Corps has got some pretty good units there Cutler's pretty beat up over here there's just nobody over here that can do anything about it I mean Anderson on the next turn 
can maybe get to here and then maybe get into a position to attack over here one three six eight potentially one unit could get here against the iron brigade maybe another unit could get here against cutler to try to knock them off the board I don't know we will see how the next turn develops all right I'm about to start turn 10 still on day one and this is I added up the points and if I've done it correctly the Union player has nine more points than the Confederate player so if everything just stayed how it was the Union player would technically have a decisive victory as far as the game goes so this is where I'm kind of like trying to decide you know do I continue as trying to game it just to win the game or do I really try to put some some strategy and tactics maybe how they would have thought back in the day like I these units that are here they're pretty weak and so are these two right here I mean I could pop up there and try to attack them but these guys will probably go off and I might get some points for that but it might net out if this was I'm I can't say for sure but I would think that if this was back then the generals might look at these units and be like, okay, these guys are pretty beat up. They did a lot of fighting already today. They need to pull back, rest up, and wait till tomorrow to get back into it. Same thing over here. I mean, this is a full strength, six strength point unit, but just popping into this forest to attack into a forest space uphill against a, a really good morale unit just doesn't seem smart. Um, and with Ram Sur here, who only has one one intact strength point left, coming up against the canister fire of this artillery that's right here, uh, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and even for the Union player to go after points by just trying to knock more Confederate units out, I don't think would be what actually would happen. I because I'd have to run off of this high ground and out of these good defensive positions to do that. And without more units to backfill those defensive positions, I don't think they would have done that. So it's really gonna turn, come down to how the chits come out of the cup um, and what order they come in. I might be able by the end of the day to get one more attack up here somewhere from the front units of Anderson's uh, division. So we'll have to wait and see. All right, we've had quite a few activations, um, not to mention the reinforcements moving up closer on the Confederate side. I've built a, a, a line of artillery here that's not really screened by any infantry, um, which in normal circumstances would look pretty juicy to charge down, but I uh, don't think I want to risk the Iron Brigade for that. And then Cutler here is um, pretty wounded. I did decide I had a three strength point unit here. Um, is this Pender's division, I think? Yeah, Pender's division moved up and now is actually in one of the victory point spots on Cemetery Ridge because this unit from the first core here only has one strength point left. I think I can get that one off the board. But the reason I came back here because the decision now for the Confederate player, uh, since they have the initiative, they can play their combat turn shit whenever they want. I think he's going to play it now. Because what happened up here, like I was kind of talking about, the 12th Corps got to activate. So the units that were in those defensive positions up on Culp's Hill moved down forward to attack roads in front of them because those reinforcements were able to come up and take those, those spots. And I think there's a pretty strong position up there. And the Confederate player is now looking at this and saying, you know what, I think I want to get my retreat as an attacker, my voluntary retreat with my combat chit before he gets to pull his combat. So even though we get approaching fire, um, that's approaching fire into wood taxes. It just doesn't look good for the Confederate player. So he's probably going to retreat up over here. Um, Davis did get to move up and is going to try to take out because he's at a se uh, seven die seven strength point unit still against a four here. So we'll try to um, push this 11th core unit off the board there. And I, I also want to just go down the line and see if I can get some um, demoralizations with this huge artillery bank. I think I can get 
at least three attacks onto this one, try to knock it out first, even and then maybe Thomas here from Penner's Division doesn't even have to take any of, of that approaching fire or actually engage in combat. If we can bombard that guy off the table first and then maybe take some points off of Cutler, the Iron Brigade, and then maybe even support this up here. We'll see how it goes. I'll come back after the combat and let you know what the results were. Well, that was kind of a disaster <laughs> for the Confederates, except over here. I mean, the attack did knock out that first corps brigade that was there on Cemetery Ridge, and the Confederate brigade actually took no damage from that. Uh, the bombardment was a complete failure. They, they did one demoralization on Cutler, um, but we, we did score a couple of hits, but the Union brigades passed their morale checks. So on bombardments, when they pass their morale checks, it does, um, it does nothing. There's no effect. I was hoping to knock out maybe two or three points from the bombardment, seeing as how there's a ton of artillery there, but the range just, most of them were attacking on a one. You know, they had to roll a one um, and a 10% chance on, you know, with three dice or four dice. I mean, based on the number of dice I rolled, well, I guess I did probably score three or four hits, so that's probably right on average, I guess, for what happened in the end. Uh, I did retreat back over there voluntarily away from and avoided that conflict, so at least we preserved some guys over there. But Davis um, was just completely annihilated. The Union Brigade there got really good rolls both the times on his approach fire attack and on the actual attack. So that was a pretty disastrous uh, attack for the, for the Confederates. So we'll see what happens in the rest of this turn. Um, might not come back. There's not a whole lot of chits left in the cut, maybe two or three. So it might be turn 11 when I come back. About to start turn 11, a couple of things did happen. Uh, the first core on the Union side got their turn and that straggler unit that had come up pretty late actually came up here and took out, um, oh, brigade was that, Thomas's brigade of Pender's division. Um, did a little bit of damage back though. Uh, they haven't moved onto that spot, so it's still technically under Confederate control. And actually plugged this hole here and thought we could do quite a bit of damage against this artillery unit, rolled very poorly for that Union attack there because the combat, the Union combat shit did come out after after that. And that canister fire from that cannon just tore through. The Confederate player actually rolled really well versus very poor rolls on the Union side. So that was a dumb move by the, uh, by the Union side. I don't think ever in history I don't know. I shouldn't say that because it's not like I'm a history professor or anything or even have barely any knowledge of history whatsoever. I don't think you would <laughs> see this huge line of cannon without any infantry screen in front of it or infantry support. Um, but I guess Anderson's going to, Anderson's probably going to come up and move into here and as our last ditch effort to try to get something to, uh, not have the Confederates lose via points um, is a, a attack over here. I mean, the Iron Brigade is is just massive uh, with its plus three um, morale. We actually could probably get up onto here. This guy's only got two left. The Iron Brigade does have four strength points left. Um, that plus three morale they just they hit so hard when they attack back so uh, I don't know we'll going to the 11th turn there's a little bit of uh, union reinforcements that come in but they're going to start way down here um, they're not going to be that big of a problem for the flank because there's they're not going to be able to get up close enough uh, during the night. And during the night turns, you cannot enter an enemy zone of control. I mean, I did pull back over here and I pulled back 
haze right here just to start you know being a hopefully enough uh spaces away to rally because you got to be out of line of sight um this unit here doesn't need to rally because he's still full strength so it doesn't matter that he's within four um, but like these guys are behind the town so they're out of line of sight and these guys over here are too far away because anything beyond four hexes is out of line of sight so we're set up to rally during the night over here um and I may eventually, or during the night, maybe pull this artillery line back a little bit, maybe up on a seminary ridge. And so we'll see, see what happens during turn 11. Okay, starting turn 11, first thing that came out was the third core, the reinforcements at Sickles Corps for the Union. They moved up from their starting hex. And then Anderson came out. Anderson was sitting back here on the road. And I just decided, you know what, let's attack. Maybe we'll get lucky and get a little bit of fire support from the bombardment before this approach fire comes in. Uh, the guys on the front line for the Union were weak. Cutler's only got one strength point left. This 11th Corps unit here's only got two strength points left. We got a lot of Confederate guys going against them. We actually have taken another victory point spot there, but I'll deal with that after because we might see some... Uh, some advancing after combat if some of these units get taken out. That Iron Brigade is tough, um, but we've got currently 11 strength points going against it. It's almost pointless to bombard it because of his plus three on his morale. So we'll try to bombard Cutler out of there so that all six of those can go against there. And then maybe these guys will just try to fire over here um, to knock some strength points off of that guy before he does his approach fire. Um, we'll see what happens. I mean, Pegram is a plus two, so he has a better chance of actually scoring hits. It's just that after you score those hits, they actually have to do something um, when they hit, and that's when you need the defending unit to fail their morale check. So I'll come back after the combat and let you know what happened. All right, that combat is over. It didn't go entirely as planned. The Iron Brigade did get knocked off the board, uh, but it wasn't at uh, a low cost for the Confederates. Anderson didn't lose any units, um, but he lost some, some steps and then also got some demoralizations. And the 11th Corps unit that was sitting here was... Um, also taken off the board. Cutler held his ground. The unit that was here that was attacking him only took one step loss, but uh, one hit, but was forced to retreat because he failed his morale check, even with the plus one morale unit. And Cutler's sitting there with one intact point left. He was able to retreat fine through Pegram that made his morale check, but there wasn't um, another retreat through here that forced uh, Jones artillery to pull back also and take a step loss because they failed their morale check having someone retreat through them and uh, Wright had to retreat back failed his morale check on his one step on his one hit that he received also I don't think that was enough to make up the point differential, even though there's more Union stuff that has been taken off of the board. Um, there's a lot of losses still on the board for uh, the Confederate side. So I'll finish out this turn, probably count up the points, and then even if the Union is winning by points, I still want to play out the other days um, just to see how it would how it goes. Okay, so that's the end of turn 11. Um, kind of just did some more maneuvering and some pulling back of people to get in position for rallying and resting during the night. Um, Anderson won't be able to move back until the first night turn because he went early before that combat. And I totaled up the scores, and this would be a decisive U.S. victory. So the U.S. has 175 points and the Confederate player 158. So... Uh, what is that, a 17-point difference? 
So I had to go for it. Um, it would have been closer if uh, the artillery bombardments did practically nothing. I had so many points of artillery that I was shooting up there on, cem on Cemetery Ridge and up on the Cemetery Hill did practically nothing. Um, if Cutler would have come off of the board, uh, that would have been another seven or eight point swing. So it would have made it even closer. And if, so just if a couple of the rolls had gone differently, it would have been very close. Um, at one point, the Confederate player did have two control markers, but there's no way that he would have had more than 1.5 times the number of victory points. But it's close enough where I want to do the night turns and go on to the second day. There'll be a lot less maneuvering and stuff on the second day because we have to take some of the movement shits out. You only get to move... Um, some of your units because I guess of fatigue and of losses and stuff is what the book says for the second day so I'm probably going to do the night turns rally stuff up and then come back and show where we are to move into the uh, start of the second day all right so I finished the night turns for July 1st and um, the Union did a little bit better as far as bringing units back onto the board. There are a lot of one strength units out there though. And I kind of maneuvered um, Johnson here into the middle for the Confederate side. So I think the plan for uh, the Confederates here, we still got a couple of good brigades for Rhodes. I think it's actually important to talk about the um, victory for the second day. So the Confederate victory is still gonna be based upon uh, taking uh, the victory point spaces. You gotta own these three right here on Culp's Hill and have more victory points than the Union, or all five of these Cemetery Hill ones here and more victory points, or Little Round Top and Big Round Top and more victory points. So we can either you know push for that side like was done historically with um i think it was hood's division i can't remember for sure they're not on the board yet and then i do have a really good portion of longstreet's core here uh, these are really strong units all really high morale and a seven five five and five strength points so we've got some good roads units here um, maybe we'll push against the hill here again, but I moved Johnson down here and Anderson is still pretty okay. He got some of his, uh, strength points rallied during the night. So maybe he can help push on the hill. So maybe Rhodes is good stuff and Anderson's good stuff. Could try to make an attack on these two spots here. Um, Union 3rd Corps uh, moved up the side here. Um, it's the Confederate right flank. They might try to press an attack over here. Um, I moved the 12th Corps. They were positioned up here in the forest. I, I moved them into position since they're completely fresh uh, onto the victory point spots to hold those. And the 11th Corps did very bad in their rally attempt rolls but i think i'll move the 11th corps up into the woods up here just to hold the flank a bunch of one point units um but they're not really victory point spots and i do have some good good cavalry up there still so we'll try to have the weak 11th corps hold up there uh the iron brigade came back uh in a huge fashion they are almost all back. They have the one, you have to have at least one demoralized uh, uh, unit or strength point. But as a plus three unit, they rally a lot. They were able to rally three points the first night phase and another two the second one because they couldn't get all six back. There's not a whole lot of strength in the first core there. So I'm thinking maybe they'll they'll try to hold right here. And I'm thinking about counterattacking. So... Hancock may just push through instead of having Hancock come up and take 
defensive positions, I may force an attack with Hancock. So that's the second core here. Um, they might just come through this hole and, and push this way. We'll see. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do yet. If I'm just going to have Johnson and Anderson and Rhodes and just all converge on here, and then send Longstreet this way, and that might make Hancock change his mind. I don't know. We'll have to see uh, what happens, how the how the chits come out of the cut for day two. But this will be the setup um, going into July 2nd. Okay, I'm cutting in here to say that I decided to make two videos for this particular game instead of just one. It was getting a little long. So I hope you're enjoying this uh, playthrough of uh, the Gettysburg battle in the Battle Hymn system by Compass Games, and I hope you're enjoying all the other series on the channel, and I'll see you in the next one.